Hello, welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened. Thank you for joining us this week. This is our monthly community connection show where we share stories and questions that you all have emailed or Facebooked us. So we've got some great questions and stories to share, and some are very spooky, which is appropriate for the season that has now just ended. Denise, before we dive into the questions, you had a really cool story you wanted to share. I do. Uh, thank you. Uh, last month, I did, I remember we had Catherine on the show, and she had done the healing temple. Well, we had another healing temple here in Maine, and when we were at the opening circle, there was a lady there who kept smiling. She was very pleasant. And I thought, oh, should I know this lady? I'm not sure. So she, it, long story short, she had listened to the show. She, and she really gave me such a heartfelt note about the impact that the show has had on her life and other people that she knows. And I just wanted to, I don't want to disclose what the note said because it was very personal for this lady, but it was very much about appreciating what we do and, and the perspective and um, community. And the lady's name is Kate, and she's just sweet as a button. And I think that we need to be aware, I guess my whole point, you never know the impact of what your words will have on someone else and how it may be a catalyst for something that they're going through in their own life. And whether you're listening to us on a podcast or talking to each other, you know, talking to your friends or your family or people in your community, you just really never know. So I, I just wanted to give a, a kind of a shout out and say thank you to Kate for sharing that because it really touched my heart. And it's just a nice reminder that when you speak your truth, you never know who you can help and inspire or, or uplift because we're all connected. Exactly. So you ready, all right, you ready for the first question? The here we go. Okay. Hi, ladies. I love your show. My friend had a house clearing in July, and the psychic medium told her that she had a toxic area in the home with awful vibrations. So my friend loaded up the space with crystals, and a few weeks later, my friend discovered what looks like mold growing inside the crystals. Pictures are attached. What does this mean? Any insight you have will be helpful. Thank you. So I think this is lovely evidence that crystals really do work and that when we ask them to absorb negative energy, they really do. I liken it to those rice experiment, experiments you can see on YouTube or you can do your own. I did my own with my daughters a couple of years back. You just take a, any you know, bag of rice, any, any kind will do, and you pour it in two separate clean, never used jars, and you write love on one and hate on the other, and you seal them up and you just monitor them. And I, I did this with my daughters to just teach them the importance of words. And after about 10 days, the jar marked hate grew this really nasty brown, black, green, gray ball of mold and nastiness. But the jar marked love, same location, same sunlight, same everything, remained perfectly clean and clear and healthy. And I think the same works for crystals. Crystals are connected to us. They are energy senders. They are energy receivers. And so when you put a crystal in a room or an office or a home or on your own person and you ask it to do something, through that law of connection, the crystals are going to say, okay, and they're going to work for you. And so clearly in this situation, the crystals absorb the negative energy in that room and it made them grow that yuckiness inside of them. Now that hopefully can be cleansed. And if it can't, I would recommend that she bury the stones in the earth so that the earth can heal those stones and thank them for the hard work they did for this woman's home. One thing I'd like to add to that is I've always been fascinated with, you know, I love rose quartz. It's one of my favorites. But at different times in my life when I've been really struggling through deep, deep emotional either work or pain or trauma, whatever it might be, and I've always made sure to have rose quartz with me, the color has changed and it's become very, very pale. It's almost like yeah. it's pulling that out. And even, I mean, you, the, the amethyst that I always hold when I'm doing readings, I was looking at it the other day and I, was, I thought, wow, this has changed so much from when I originally started to use it. 
because it's absorbed so much and, and reflected so much back for me. Isn't that amazing? It you is. know, I have a clear quartz that I wear around my neck every day. And I know when I have to cleanse it because it looks cloudy. It mm-hmm. looks like it needs to be cleansed. Sometimes I can just feel it. It'll feel weightier around my, my neck. And so then I will cleanse it and, and recharge it. But I just think these are all examples that these stones really do work. Right. Uh, the next question is a little bit different, Ben, and it comes from a woman in Australia who found our podcast earlier this year and has been working her way through them. And she's very complimentary and telling us how helpful it's been to finally understand some of the things she's been experiencing since when she was a little girl. And her question is, is, she said, my question is about my mom. I'm in a very similar situation to Samantha. As a side note, also 44, have thir- three kids, oldest being 17 and also a teacher. But unfortunately, my mom has also made it her mission to alienate me from all of my other relatives. When I was 17, I started to question her treatment of me and stand up for myself after years of emotional and sometimes physical abuse. My brother, sister-in-law, uncles, aunts, cousins have all bought the lies she's told them. I think she started this way back then to discredit me because she was afraid I was going to share some of the horrible things she's done and choose to, chose to paint me as a horrible person. My dad didn't see the worst of it, but I'm still just as disappointed in him for not standing up to her. My mom is very nice to everyone else in public and is very popular. No one would believe how she has treated me. I've just started to tune into my psychic abilities again after shutting them down as a teenager. I think my mom is also very psychic, but would never admit this to anyone. I'm worried about when my mom passes over. If she's this horrible to me in person here on earth, can I really expect her to be different after passing? I'm worried about what harm she could do to us from the other side. My husband is very supportive and my kids are all empaths and very intuitive. So I'm always talking about how to protect themselves, but she's very powerful and I worry that won't be enough. I know we have a team looking out for us. The female energy pops in from time to time. When I was very upset one day, I felt a hand on my shoulder and someone said, don't worry, we'll help you. I have always been told during a very accurate reading that a female grandparent is very angry with her and my dad about how they've treated me and is waiting for them to let me have it. Do you think my team and I will be enough to protect my family when she passes over? By then, my kids will probably be away at college, and I'm not sure other than praying and meditating how to protect them remotely when they are no longer near me. Uh, she apologizes for the long message, but um, and she's, I love that she put this in there. Samantha, hurry up and write that book already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for that. If you could, I will pray for you and your situation if you can pray that I find the energy and time to finish the darn thing. I would be very, very grateful. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is such a good question. And I think if anyone has grown up with a narcissistic parent and they're very honest with themselves, I think they'll admit that we've all had that thought. You know, if they're this powerful now, what's going to happen when they cross over? But you know, Denise, I think that her mother is this powerful because people have given her that power. Very good point. And when she gets to the other side, she's not going to be surrounded by people who are giving her that power. She's going to be surrounded by people who are going to be teaching and encouraging her gently to see how her actions have affected the generational lines. It reminds me of that dream I had, which I think was a visit, not a dream, years ago when I was awakening to my own intuition. My grandmother, my mother's mother, was very mean. She had lots of reasons to be mean. Don't they always, Denise? Mm -hmm. (laughs) She had a very difficult childhood and tended to rely on that for her reasons for cruelty. And when I had this dream, she came to me in my living room and she looked awful. And she said, I need your prayers. And I knew without going into all the details of the dream, I knew that she had spent these years on the other side going through this life review. And I also got the sense that it took her years because she died when I was 12. And I had this dream when I was around 33 or 34. So she'd been over there a long time. And she said, I need your prayers to continue to heal and grow on the other side. And I called up my mom and I was really proud of my mom because she listened 
and she called up her sisters and her cousin who grew up with them, and we all started to pray for my grandmother. I called up my sisters, and they agreed to send up some prayers, and I'd have to check my journals, but it wasn't much longer. A couple of weeks later, I had a dream, and she appeared to me, and she looked beautiful, and she was glowing, and she just said thank you, and then she just literally ascended like through the ceiling. Uh, of my home in the dream, and I knew that those prayers had helped. I like to think of this earth as school, and I like to think of this lifetime as the test. And you know, when you're taking the test, the teachers, they're not coming up to you going, oh, no, no, number two is wrong. You forgot to add those numbers in the first <laughs> column. You got to redo that one. You know, we're just dropped here, and we're on our own. But when we get to the other side, it's like the testing time is done and you get to be with your teachers again and you get to review the test and you get to review the things you did wrong and the things you did right and you get to try again. So I hope that brings her comfort that, first of all, the mother has all this power because people are giving her that power. And if her mother is that powerful in her negative negativity, imagine how powerful this listener is in her positivity. And so I would invite her to lean into that light and to really embrace it and to start to explore the limitless dimensions of her own personal power. And I love the fact that her children are all empathic. Her husband is supportive. So it doesn't matter if they're away at school or it doesn't, the timeline of when her mom transitions isn't as important as they're a united front. And based on someone who has experienced losing some people in my life who were less than supportive while they were here, there's, and I no disrespect in any way, shape, or form in any direction in time and space, there's a freedom when the person isn't manipulating the puppet strings anymore. And that transition time, when you do, it may take a while before you feel any connection from the person who's passed, but one thing to do is to send love, to say, I forgive you, to forgive yourself to, I mean, it's, it's a process. It's, a, I think that the relationship continues after the, the physical death, but we still do the healing work long after. I agree. Um, I, I would like to respectfully and gently disagree with one thing. I okay. don't think she should <laughs> offer forgiveness. I'm just, I'm afraid, I don't like this whole theory that we have to forgive these people right away. I don't think that's... Oh, I don't think right away. Oh, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. But I so think don't if you, you can find get that to in that a lot of spiritual right. books, they tell oh, you yeah. just forgive them. It's a process, just like anything else, to go for it. I mean, what are the, the stages of grief with Kubler-Ross? There's still that you have to go through those stages, but I think if you can get to that place where you can at least try to see it from their perspective of why they might have been doing it, or I mean, yeah. I'm talking years and years into it, just to use the forgive word. Yes, no, I agree with you. I just think when we go from anger to forgiveness, we leapfrog over a really important stage, and that's validating our pain. And I think yeah. it's in validating our pain that we find our point of power. Very well put. Very, very well. And I would recommend that she check out Dr. Carol McBride. I just think her work on daughters of narcissistic mothers is so important. Okay, our next question says Good afternoon. Thank you so much for your podcast. I listen to them in my car on my way to school and home as much as possible. I've been on a spiritual awakening for the past two years and definitely am an intuitive empath. I discovered Reiki about two years ago and instantly signed up to become a Lightarian master and got all the attunements I could. As I've been going through the clearing process and my chakras have been opening up and clearing all the karmic attachment residue I've been holding on to, I'm finally at my third eye, which will not clear. And I know it's because of fear of opening them up. As much as I want to clear it, I'm also terrified. For about six to eight years of my adolescence, I was terrorized at night by a shadow man and what I now believe to be the hat man. I haven't done a lot of research, only from what I've heard in some other podcast. I'm afraid to even talk about it since I left for college and moved out of my childhood home. He has not been a problem. I pray clear and protect myself every night before I go to sleep. I pray that angels and Archangel Michael protect me. I've been told I'm protected and need not to fear anymore. 
and I've had multiple dreams that there's nothing to be afraid of. But opening up still terrifies me because I do not want to let this back into my life. The shadow men visited me every couple of nights. I would have sleep paralysis and I would wake up and sometimes felt held down with them over me as if they were trying to suck my soul away through my mouth. Other times I would wake up and they would be either standing next to my bed or in the corner. I sometimes would see a shadow hound running by my room. I'm afraid if I open up my third eye that I may be opening up the door again, which I closed so tightly when I was about 19 or 20. I have a theory that this would only happen in my childhood room. Whenever I slept anywhere else, it would not happen. When we bought our current home with my husband, the house had such a happy, positive vibration, and I've never had a problem sleeping in the 10 years we've been here. I know that this is something I need to get over and move through in order to clear and step into the full light. Your October connection spoke deeply to me. Every story I connected with and identified with, I am a mom. I've had many experiences throughout my life that are good and bad with spirit. I believe I'm called to be a healer. I love Reiki. Your upcoming interview with Heidi Hollis is very exciting to me. I'm afraid to visit her website because I'm afraid to talk about or think about what has haunted me or acknowledge it. I've barely told anyone in my life about it, but I'm interested to hear what she has to say. And I thank you for providing this type of information and to help me understand more clearly who I am and that I am not alone. Wow. Well, I thank her for sharing this story because clearly it's a scary, traumatic story for her to share. I do want to say, Denise, about my Heidi Hollis interview. Did I tell you what happened? No. Oh, my gosh. You all have to listen to this. So we did the interview. It, was, it went really, really well. There were no glitches, no problems. And that Sunday, Deb texted me and said, hey, I just checked um, and you didn't upload the show for tonight's you know, episode. And I said, no, I did. I did it the day after we did the interview. We interviewed her at night because she had to work late. And I said, so first thing in the morning, I edited it, put it up there, it's done. And she said, well, check because it's not there. I was like, well, that's weird. So I checked and she was right. It was not there. And I was like, son of a gun. So I said, well, I'll just go back into the download files and pull the interview out and edit it again and repost it. Denise, it's gone. It's gone. Holy moly. It's not anywhere. It's not on my computer. It's not on the service we use to record the interview. It's not in my download files. It's not in Audacity files. It's gone. And you had and it. So that, you, you edited it. Uh, oh, you yeah. posted it. Oh, that's, yeah. that's creepy. And it's so funny because she had commented, gosh, this went really well. And she was saying after we stopped recording, you know, that sometimes she'll have issues on interviews. And she thinks it's shadow people like trying to in- interrupt her from sharing this message of how to fight and protect against these things. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, good thing. we. So anyway, we don't have the episode and I don't know if she's even going to be willing to re-interview again. I feel oh, terrible yeah. about it, but I think it's spooky. I think it's weird. Don't you? Very much so. Very, very much so. Now, Ooh. her premise so uh, Heidi Hollis has a website. She is the first one to name this phenomenon of shadow people. And her premise, her belief is that they feed off of fear, that that's their food. And that's why they appear as these scary things. I agree with her. I think fear can be a powerful energy boost for negative things in people. But I also think it's interesting to me. If you talk to any intuitive, medium, healer, or light worker, Let's just imagine you put a bunch, like 10 light workers in one room. And then imagine that you put 10 left brains in a room, you know, mathematicians, engineers, business people, scientists. I will bet you that every single right brained intuitive healer in that room will have had at least one scary experience of what our listener is talking about in her email. And then if you go into the other room with the engineers and the scientists and the grounded practical people, I will bet you that almost none of them will have had a scary experience. And I don't think it's necessarily because, oh, well, intuitives are more open to the other dimensions and they can see this stuff. I think there's some type of divine plan. And I think there might be some type of negative divine plan. Well, I shouldn't put those two words together. What I'm trying to say is, I think the dark side knows who we light workers are. And I think they start trying to dissuade us from sharing our light early on when we're children. And I think it works for a, lar- a large majority of the people. 
I think you are so, so spot on with that. And I was just thinking about how I can talk to one of my children about, you know, animal totems and energies. And the other one, he, God love him, he, he uses it, I've shared this, he uses his intuition to uh, fix things, to repair things, to figure out how to make something work better. To I mean, he just, he's very, very uh, linear sequential. But he, he'll say to me, I'll share something that's kind of woo-woo, and he'll say, really? Almost like, hmm. And I know, God love him, he's trying so hard to get it, but he's not wired that way. He's just not wired that way. And, and over the years, because he's a man now, he's a little more amenable to it. But we, we've joked about it, so I'm not throwing him under the bus by saying that. I think that it, you're so, so spot on with that description. Yeah, I think that they try to prevent us from opening up because God knows that was my block for years. I, I mean, I was so similar to her email where I was so excited to take Reiki and to learn about crystals and to learn about psychometry and all of this. But there was always this little nagging thought at the back of my head that the scary stuff from my childhood, the nightmares and the, mm -hmm. the shadow stuff would come back. And I did a couple of things that I think helped. Uh, one thing I did, uh, Deb Joel and I did a power of three meditation for a full month, and we um, each stated an intention for the other to pray for, and my intention was, it is safe for me to see, and I felt buoyed and confident knowing that I had two friends praying and intending that it would be safe for my third eye to open again, so I would recommend that she consider trying that. If you don't know how to do it, you can get Lynn McTaggart's book, The Power of Eight, um, Deb and I are talking about teaching the Power of Three class again in the late winter, so she could join us for that. And the other thing I did, I did a lot of past life regression work on my own. I would just listen to some of Brian Weiss's CDs, and I would try to reduce or imagine, visualize myself cutting cords to any aspects of my past lives where I was injured or ridiculed or ostracized for having this ability. I think that helped a lot. And then I just started really reading about the light and what it is to be a light worker and what it is to be protected by the light. And I started to lean on that more and I started to lean into that more. And slowly, it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen after one weekend workshop. It happened slowly. But slowly I started to see how much more powerful the white light is than the dark side. And that really helped me, I think, to fully open well, I don't know that my third eye is fully open yet. I think we're all a work in progress, but it definitely helped my third eye to open and to give me the courage and confidence needed to do this work to the best of my abilities. What would you recommend? I, I agree with what you're saying. And also the time factor that with practice and as you become more proficient at opening and closing your energy, feeling more confident, protecting yourself, you're able to deflect the negativity a lot more easily than, I don't get the scary stuff. Very, very rarely do I get that now. And when I do, it almost catches me by surprise because it's been so long since it's happened. So I think that sometimes if I'm around a lot of negative people or um, there's a lot of unrest going on around me that sometimes that opens that door a little bit so I have to be conscientious to make sure but I, I agree that as you develop your own inner knowing and your own inner skill set to work with the energies it helps immensely yeah I do too and read up on psychic protection yes really read that read the old stuff read what Dion Fortune said read what Ted Andrews said and then read some of the newer works on psychic protection but I think all of that helps and just keep at it because Lord knows, Denise, we need more light workers right now. We do. And I'm just going to throw in this. This has been on my mind a lot, a lot the last few days is with all of the unrest in the world right now. And I will placate myself by saying, you know, we chose a really interesting time to be on the planet. We came here to help all of those things, but I am almost obsessed with the thought of kindness causing a ripple. And I think that, can you imagine if every single one of us listening to this just randomly started doing more kind, being more kind, not buying into this negativity and this fear-based bullshit, 
I really, in my heart of hearts, think it would help shift things. I really do. Yeah. And it's also it's something- it's starting in the community level of, so no, we can't control what's happening nationally or globally, but we should, can sure control being nice to the person next to us in line or letting the person in front of us in traffic go through. I mean, stupid little things that really, really raise the vibration quickly. Yes, and that aren't stupid or little in the in the long run, in the bigger picture. Right. Because That's it one does thing I want to talk to you about um, off air. I, I really would love to try to think about something for the new year where we do a kindness moment, you know, where maybe on Facebook we post and, and once a week we just ask everybody at a certain time every week to just have a minute of sending kindness out into the world. I think it's connected with why we're all waking up right now. Yeah. I do too. Um, so, All right, go ahead. Uh, I just recently discovered your podcast. Is I'm addicted. Okay, I'm very new to all this, and I'm trying to educate myself and strengthen my intuition. When I was a child, there were several times that I recall being woke, awoken in the middle of the night by the voices of two men talking right outside of my door. When I would work up enough courage to go look, there was never anyone there. I knew I was not dreaming, and I was scared. Another time as a child, I woke up in the middle of the night to see a young boy and a man that I believed to be his grandfather. As crazy as this sounds, they were grooming a horse. They both paused and looked at me and then went back to grooming. I asked them to go away because I was terrified, and they did. I've always had very vivid dreams and never understood why so many people around me say that they don't remember their dreams, but I think I'm beginning to understand why. I've had loved ones visit me in my dreams where I know they've passed, and they know they've passed, but they just wanted to let me know they're okay. Recently, a coworker of mine has been popping into my head a ton, and I don't know why. I just kept waiting for some sign that would help me understand why she was on my mind so much. Then the other night I had a dream. In my dream, it was pouring outside, and I saw an elderly man standing at my door. I opened the door and invited him in so that they could get out of the rain. He graciously smiled and thanked me, but then said he was waiting for her, and when she is ready, he'll come in and alongside her. At this point in my dream, I noticed there was an elderly woman sitting in a chair next to him. She had her back to me and did not look my way. The gentleman continued to smile at me, and I said, okay, and told him again that they were welcome to come in. He again thanked me and said, I'm waiting for her, and when she's ready, we'll come in. I then closed the door and woke up. When I woke up, I didn't know who these people were or what it all meant. As I was getting ready for work, my coworker popped back into my head and again on my drive to work. Then hit me, I had the strong feeling that this man was her father who passed many years ago, and the woman he is waiting for is her mother, who is currently very ill. I wanted to tell my coworker so bad, but I, I didn't want her to think I'm crazy. I didn't say anything for a day or two, and also that fear of what if I'm wrong, what if it if they weren't her parents, what if it's the wrong message? On my drive home, I was listening to one of your podcasts and you were talking about how an old friend had been popping into your mind and how you finally just called her and later found out she got engaged. Your words encouraged me to say something to my coworker. The next day I told her and I was scared as to how she would take it. In the end, she was so grateful that I shared that with her and she doesn't think I'm crazy. She cried tears of relief because she said she knows her mom is in pain wants to go, but is holding out for her daughters. She said this message just gives her a sense of comfort knowing that her dad will be there to greet her mom. We both cried a little while and then continued to have a wonderful conversation. I felt like a weight has been lifted and I just wanted to say thank you for inspiring me. I just want to throw something out really quickly about that. I was listening to a show on Hay House Radio this morning when I was walking the dogs and it was Sandra Ann Taylor and her sister Sharon Klingler and they almost verbatim talked about this same thing and it said spirits always around us they're always always around us but they have to find who can hear them see them sense them they're around all of us but and the way she described this i love 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 this description she said they look for this pinpoint of lights that we send out and then they'll come in and the reference she made was that she was doing a reading and she was getting uh messages for the woman's dear friend and she said, well, please just, um, the grandmother is coming through. And they, they found out that the grandmother was connected to this woman's friend. But the woman's friend would have been totally, there's no way, there's no spirit world, I don't believe this. So she came through this other person who would believe it and understand it. 
we pass along a message. And I, I think that's another correlation with why we're all waking up so quickly is they have a lot of messages they're trying to get through right now. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And they will always look for whoever is open. It doesn't, there's no discrimination there or it has to be a family member or it has to be a good friend. Anyone who is connected to their loved one who can get the message through, they will take. They will take that opportunity, as would you if you were on the other side and needed to get a message of comfort across. So I think that's wonderful, and I'm so glad that we were able to inspire her to take action on this intuitive message that she received. It's really comforting. All right, you ready for the next one? Yes. Hello, Denise and Samantha. I love your podcast and all you do for the enlightened souls walking the earth trying to find connection. After listening to your October Paranormal podcast before I went to work yesterday, I wanted to share an incident that happened to me last night. I have had readings with you both, so I'm comfortable telling you what I do because you already know. There's this old house which has been vacant for years. A mother took her own life with her daughters in the house. The family started to then have domestic and alcohol issues. She told me she had not felt right since they moved into that house, and I could tell by her crystals and sage she was spiritual. I asked her if she had sage the house, and she said she had. I told her the house had a weird energy, even though it was beautiful, but she should continue to work on it. The husband has not been able to go back to the home, and last night, the son called 911 because his mom was acting out of control, intoxicated, and yelling at him. It was a heartbreaking scene. The mom was almost wild, not acting anything like herself. I know something dark was attached to her. The son was such an enlightened soul and was picking up on all the little cues that his mom was not okay. She told me she was going to harm me and through this insanely mad energy that attached to me, I instantly got a fever and a headache. I felt awful. Unfortunately, I had to stay working late to get all the paperwork done. I just could not wait to get this energy off of me. When I left work, I got into my car and started chanting that no bad energy, thoughts, entities could attach to me from his, from this house or this family. I said it over and over again. I sent love and healing light to the mother and the children and sent whatever energy was affecting me back into the light to heal. Like a light switch, the fever was gone and I felt normal again. The whole situation is so sad. I know there is an entity or some energy in that house that's attaching to the parents and feeding off this fear. Please send them light and prayers, and I will continue to do the same. Your teachings gave me the tools to get that bad energy that was affecting me to release, and I'm thankful every day for you and the knowledge you share. Wow. That's such a frightening and impactful story. Incredibly. And also the fact that she fought back energetically is a huge, huge thing that she, she A, recognized what was happening, and imagine being a highly empathic person and choosing a line of work where you were constantly in that level of energy, I think that's a very warrior empath energy to come in for. I really do. Mm -hmm. That's big big work to come in and do. I agree. And, And I think it's just a great reminder that with something as what we might consider simple as a prayer, we really can get this stuff off of us. You know, you and I get a lot of emails, and Facebook messages saying, I think I have negative energy in my home or something negative around me. What do I do? What do I do? And I think they're looking for us to reply and with something like um, get dirt from this area of the earth, add these herbs to it, chant these words, turn around three times. I, I don't know. Because I think they want something really complicated and specific, but it's neither It's simply prayer and standing in your own power and asking for the help from the light. It's really, really simple. And I think people are often, I don't know, discouraged by the simplicity of that. I think they want something more complicated, but it's not. It's really just prayer and self-empowerment and setting those boundaries. You are not allowed in my home. You are not allowed in my space. And then as you would in most situations, calling on, on help to help you get the negative uh, energy away. It's all energy, everything, whether it seems concrete, whether it seems carbon-based, it's still vibrating at a frequency that you can choose how you react to it. Yeah, I agree. Okay, do we have time for for more? Yeah. This is going by so fast. These are great stories. (laughs) They are. Uh, This is, hi, Denise and Samantha. I just listened to your podcast. We were talking about poltergeist. You were talking about Disney. 
being the most haunted place on earth. I just wanted to share the last two times I've been to Disney, I've been bombarded with strangers' faces while I was trying to go to sleep. I told them to stop and they did. My usual work does not include rescue mediumship, but damn it, I was on vacation with my family. The first visit, my son, who was almost three, would not sleep by himself or in his room when we got back. The second time, my daughter, who was also almost three for the first time in her life, started screaming in the middle of the night and would not stay in her room to sleep. When it happened with my son, I just thought we were regressing because it was in his pattern to do that. But my daughter had always slept in a room in her bed by herself, so it was completely out of character for her. We have been home from Disney for almost two months, and my daughter and son are still having trouble sleeping and are coming into our room at night. I've tried everything I can think of, crystals, sage, clearing spray, just letting them be crazy to exhaust themselves, and I don't know what else to do. Especially my daughter, I feel like something is going on. I know both of them are psychic, but only my son seems to be empathic. My daughter is more of a mean girl who's bossy, controlling, and thinks she's always right. Thank you in advance for all the good work you do and any help you can give. I think I've said this before on the show, so I apologize for repeating myself, but I believe that when you're dealing with an empathic, intuitive child, it's not enough to simply clear the energy for them. I think you have to teach them how to clear it for themselves. When my children have dealt with negative stuff in their own childhood, not being able to sleep or having nightmares or or even something more negative, I taught them how to say the prayer of protection, how to call on Archangel Michael. I taught them to say out loud, I command and demand that you leave my space and my energy now and forever in all directions of time. I did this when they were three and four years old. So I don't think an age necessarily has to have a limit on it. I mean, obviously, if they're an infant, you need to speak it for them. But as soon as they're up walking and talking, you can teach them how to say these prayers and how to stand in their own power. And I really think that's the most important thing you can do to get this negative stuff away from them. But I think we need to Instead of, have you heard that new phrase, Denise, it's, it, they don't call them helicopter moms anymore. They call them lawnmower moms because they try to just, well, the new thing is these moms who try to clear away from their children's path any, any obstacle so that their child can just have an easy breezy childhood, which I get. Look, I would be the best lawnmower mom if I didn't know better because that's my goal is to just give them an easy breezy childhood. But I've had to learn that that's not life and that's not helpful and that's not really teaching them how to stand in their own power. So I think with anything in life, whether it's a bully at school or a bad teacher or negative shadow stuff at night, I really think it's our job as parents to teach our children to give them the tools to clear the obstacles from their own path rather than doing it ourselves. So that's the number one thing I would recommend. And also to just, I agree with that entirely. Myself, if I stay in a hotel or I go to any kind of an amusement park or any uh, concert, any venue where there's a lot of people or there have been a lot of people, I get bombarded and I have to really, really amp up my, my buffer, my you know, energetic shields that I put up because there's so much residual energy that is left in those places. And I think, especially with little kids who are so porous and so wide open, they're going to suck that stuff up like a sponge. So I think protecting before you go is also very, very important. I agree. Okay, this next one I'm going to need your help with, Denise. Okay. Dear Samantha and Denise, I'm writing because I've had something strange happen to me, and I'm hoping you can help me understand it. I've had several instances of sitting quietly and suddenly seeing smoke and smelling something burning. It's happened to me three times. It scares me because it feels like I'm catching on fire. I don't see flames, just smoke tendrils, and I can distinctly smell something burning. I do physically see smoke, and then it all goes away. Help me to not be scared by this and better understand what it means. I feel like I need more information to properly answer that question. Like, I'd like to know, is there a history of fire connected to the home? Was anyone in her family connected to fire? Any firefighters in her family that are trying? Like I, I would need to know more information. What, what do you think? I agree. I agree. And it's the fact that it's she's smelling it and seeing it. And I don't know, have you ever done readings and you'll smell cigarette smoke or you'll smell pipe yeah. smoke or you'll smell? So it's a, a, 
you know, calling card from spirit in another way. And I don't get the smells as often, but when I do, I really love it because it's unique to me or I'll smell lilacs or I'll smell. Uh, so I'm wondering if it's a connection with spirit or someone who, again, that you said would have a connection with, with the um, fire and smoke and she's not seeing the flames. I don't know. I agree right. with you. We don't have enough information, but I do feel like there's another worldly connection. I don't feel like her, it's something in her electrical system in her home. No, I mean, I think it's always a good idea to rule that out, but I feel like this could be either the home's energy connecting, uh, someone who maybe passed in the home or who lived in the home who passed in the fire situation, or it could be uh, someone on the other side who, you know, like I said, was a firefighter. It, it could be a lot of different things. So without having that information, I would just say that she should talk to her guides and say, hey, here's what's going on. I don't understand it. If it's meant for me to understand, y'all need to come up with a better way to make this more clear. If it's not meant for me to understand, if it's just something strange and odd happening because of the home's energy, then you need to help me clear that energy. But I would definitely ask for more specification from my team on the other side. I think that would help a lot. Very much. So. And I want to throw in one quick thing that I had just been doing some research on is on smoke divination. And I don't know how to properly pronounce the word, but it's, it's either, and I'm going to stumble on this, capnomacy or um, libanomancy, but it, it's about watching how the smoke tendrils go up. And also, there's different ways to divine this, but it goes way, way, way back historically, people reading smoke. So I'm wondering, too, if it's a cue from like an ancient connection for this person about divination. I know that's a little mm -hmm. random way out there, but I just think it's kind of a, a not a coincidence because I don't believe in them. But interesting that uh, I was just reading about that and then to have this question about smoke come up. Yeah, I definitely think it should be looked into. And I would just I would keep researching and asking more information. Yes, I agree. You ready for the next one? I am. Okay. It says, first, thank you so much to you, Deb and Denise, for all, for sharing yourselves with us. This is directed to you, Samantha. You have, all have made me feel understood and have helped me understand myself. I've wanted to write to you for a while, especially earlier, to tell you a beautiful story of my dad finding ways to connect with me even after having passed 17 years ago. Instead, I'm writing because while I've had a traumatic experience, I'm still trying to shake. I know that your podcast and learning more about being an empath has put me in a better headspace than I would have been otherwise. I have a really bad commute. It's an hour on a good day, and I spend a lot of time stuck in traffic. Last Thursday, on my way home from work, as I was sitting in traffic, I saw a man jump off a highway overpass and kill himself. Everything went silent. I just prayed for love and life for him and myself. My dog was in the back seat, and I was just trying not to panic so I could get us home safely. I don't know why, but it literally felt like I was the only person to see this happen. When I looked around, no one seemed bothered by anything. When I got home, I really didn't know what to do with myself. I just kept wondering, why was I meant to witness this? How is no one else talking about this? I scoured the internet, and no one said anything except the transit's Twitter mentioned backups, and I saw people commenting, asking what happened because they saw a body bag. But again, there hasn't been any mention of it. I don't know what to do or who to tell, so I went to my empaths group on Facebook. It was my first time posting, and it felt kind of weird about it, but I just asked for light for myself to be able to move through this and love and light and help for this soul to cross over peacefully and not be in any more pain. So many people commented and sent love his and my way, and they mentioned that maybe I was his witness because I care and would send love his way without judgment, and that I also brought this whole other group of people together to send love his way to help with this transition, and that has brought me a little peace, though I'm still going through some PTSD. A few days ago, as I was contemplating all of this, I was washing dishes, listening to the radio, and the DJ was talking about what a great song Earth, Wind, and Fires, September is, and we should turn up the volume for it. But what came out of the radio instead was Sarah McLachlan's Angel. I stopped in my tracks and somehow knew it was a message for me. The lyrics, of course, made sense, but it wasn't until yesterday that I looked them up and found out that she had written the song in response to the suicide of another musician. So I guess it just seems like more validation of something that the song was meant for me. 
I guess what I'm trying to say is if I hadn't explored my own spiritual path or taken the time to understand my empathy, I likely would have handled this very differently. And I'm sure it would have been exponentially more damaging to my emotional and mental wellness. I hope all this makes sense. And I hope all of you amazing women know how special you are and how important the work you are is doing, just putting yourselves out there and allowing yourself to be a mirror for the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Much love and light. And then she mentions to you, you know, as an aside, did you know Delilah is back on the air? I figured you'd get a kick out of that. So I don't know what yeah. the Delilah reference is, but. It's a, it's a radio show, a radio personality. You know, I love this story, Denise, because I often, and I know you have as well, when we do mediumship readings or um, if we feel a message from a loved one on the other side, oftentimes we will get a thank you that will come through after the reading. And I feel like what she was getting by hearing that song was a thank you from that dear man on the bridge. Mm -hmm. I agree. And it's just a lovely confirmation that there is no time, there is no space in this energetic world we live in, that our prayers, our thoughts, and our intentions are heard and seen and felt, and they do matter. And I'm glad that she also reached out to a community of like-minded people to help her through this time. But I'm especially glad she got really, like if that song had just come on, I'd be like, oh, that's really interesting. But the fact that the DJ specifically mentioned Earth, Wind, and Fire, right? and then that song came on, I think makes it pretty clear that this was a thank you from heaven. And also that the community supported what she said and pulled together. And I think that's what we're all trying to foster with one another now is that we feel safe sharing so that we can we can come together as a community and help with the healing i agree 100 percent. okay we've got about five minutes so hopefully we'll have time for this last one i wanted i write to you tonight to tell me sorry to tell you how much i'm enjoying your podcast i discovered it about a week and a half ago and i listened to it while i work i'm writing to you today because even before hearing or learning about your podcast i have felt and probably have known for a while that i'm an empath Although I do feel that some of the items on your list of you are an empath, I do not fall under. For example, I am not an organized person. I am truly an introvert and a few more. I do really feel that I have had somewhat of a gift and have just completely tumbled down a hill and off the beaten path. I do not have many people around me that believe in this line of work or are accepting of it because they don't understand. I feel with life getting so busy over the last number of years and multiple circumstances, I have deviated from who I truly am. I've tried smudging my home a number of times and have tried to realign my chakras. I have crystals with me almost always and I try to stay positive, but something is holding me back or blocking me. I feel negative a lot of the time. I really do not like this feeling. More to say, I was 12 years old when my grandfather passed away. We had such a strong connection and almost every night for a year after he passed, he would visit me in my dreams. He would grab my hand and we would fly through the house together. I do not have this and have not for a long time. I used to have many moments of deja vu where I could feel something that was about to happen and sometimes did come true. Recently, I find myself emotional. I cannot be around someone who is crying because I end up crying with them. I find it overwhelming to be around people who are negative or rude, mean or disrespectful. However, my dreams have become more vivid and frequent again lately. I feel like I'm close to returning to that path once more, but I am still experiencing some blockages. How do I deal with family that I live with and friends who are not understanding of these feelings and chalk them up to me being so sensitive? I haven't had much success with meditation in the past, so what else is there to do to relax and reset my chakras? And are there any steps or suggestions you would make for me to progress and help me connect with my angels and spirit guides? Well, I think that that is a really long question, and I hope, Denise, you and I can try to answer it in the limited amount of time we have left. One thing I want to start off Saying is that when we are waking up to who we are, going through that spiritual awakening, oftentimes we will go through a period of negativity or isolation or sadness. I always liken it to Reiki. When when you're whenever you're attuned to Reiki, the my teacher at least explained it to me that you imagine the Reiki energy is like Drano going through your body, and it's unclogging all old negativity and blocks that have accrued throughout your lifetime. And if you think about a clogged drain, when you pour that draino into it, it all bubbles up and gets really yucky and gross before you can wash it away and clear it and have a new drain again. And that's kind of how I think about the spiritual awakening, that you're clearing out 
a whole lifetime of luck and debris and negativity. So the first thing I would say to her is just to be patient while you're going through this process and don't think it's a sign that you're not on the right path. You know, as Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. So the first thing I would say is keep going with this path. It, when you have friends and family who just don't understand, that's when I still struggle with Denise. And I tend to, I used to tend to not be my authentic, my authentic self around them. I would try to hide my sensitivity. Now I don't. Now I am just my sensitive old self, but I own it more to them. Like I'll, I'll say to them, you know, you might not realize it because I am sensitive, but it kind of hurt my feelings when you said such and such. I'm not asking for an apology. I'm just speaking my truth. So now I kind of own it more, and that's helped a lot. Do you have any suggestions with insensitive friends and family? Yes, I think, you know, trying to be as selective as possible if you can monitor when you have to be around them. But also that's why I started journaling every day was because I was so sensitive and so shy and so introverted that I couldn't really express that stuff to anyone else and have it what at the time felt have it be received without being um, turning into a negative situation. So if you journal or you can talk to yourself, whatever it might be, but if you can get it out of your system and you can write, you know, that really hurt me when, or I, I know I'm sensitive, but, and, and build yourself up through your own inner dialogue of it's okay. Also, what a beautiful time in the fact that we can get online and find other like, my, similar to what the lady said in the last letter is we can find people online and they may not be right there in our, our personal space, but there are people out there that we can reach out to and say, oh my gosh, you understand what I'm talking about. I think the more and more of us who find this and and do honor our own inner light and sensitivity, the more we're normalizing that this is an okay way to be on the planet, especially with the kids coming in who aren't shutting it off. So I I would, you know, I'm a big proponent of inner work and writing and turning within to find your answers, but it also can give you a safe place to express yourself. I think that's also a good part of her question about meditation. Because in a way, your morning pages are your meditation. Right. And it, it's amazing to me all the years that I've been doing this. Sometimes I can wake up and I'll be grouchy or I'll be upset about something. By the end of those pages, I'm in a better mindset. And it got through mm. me, got me through many, many toxic years of, you know, uh, leaving a, a relationship that wasn't supportive of in a job that was difficult. And I would write through it before I had to face that for the day. And it really was such a a cord of strength for me, and it still is. And, you know, there's so many ways to meditate. I just wouldn't try a couple and say, oh, well, this isn't for me. I really think getting into a practice of meditation is crucial for surviving and thriving in this world and maintaining our spiritual connection. And so I would recommend that she try different types of meditation. Yoga is a form of meditation. Walking is a form of meditation. You can do Sometimes if I'm working on something in my life, I'll just take my rosary beads or my mala beads and I'll say my intent on each single bead, my affirmation. That's a form of meditation. You can also um, stare into a crystal, a crystal. Yes, I was going to say crystal. Look at that. I thought I picked the wrong word and I didn't. You can stare into a crystal as a form of meditation or a candle flame. There's so many that you can do guided visualization. You can do, I have a friend who cannot meditate, can't do it. She can't sit still. And so she went to her unity church. They have a weekly meditation group on Monday nights and you sit in these awful, uncomfortable, you know, sterile folding chairs in this open gymnasium type thing. I could not meditate there. But she does it, and she loves it. And the only way she can meditate is in a group setting. So you just never know what's going to be it for you. But I don't think just because one or two or three or four ways didn't work for you that you should give up trying to meditate. I think I think we all need to find that way to go within that works for us. The beauty of, of YouTube or the meditation timer you can put on your phone is if something doesn't resonate for you, find somebody else who does. And that ties in with, you know, doing a meditation to reach your your angels or your guide. I listened to one by Gordon Smith the other day, and boy, did that resonate for me. It was like kapow. 
through the top of my head, whereas I've listened to similar processes from other people and couldn't get there. So I think it's interesting how someone may present it in a way in a guided meditation or a, a visualization or a journey type of work that will really hit you and, and open up those doors to make the connection as well. Excellent point. I totally agree. So we have some other questions. Maybe we'll do a part two this month or we'll just save them for next month for sure. We thank you guys so much for sending in your questions and sharing so much of your authentic journey with us. It really means a lot to us and hopefully to our listeners. We hope that you have a beautiful, happy, blessed rest of your week. Don't forget to always show up, do great work, and share your light. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.